But I sort of argue that what's happening isn't religion is becoming more uh, scientific or secular or rational. The, the market is becoming an, uh, a mystical object of worship. Mm -hmm. The market is becoming sanctified. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Chris Lehman. He's the author of the provocative and powerful new book, The Money Cult, Capitalism, Christianity, and the Unmaking of the American Dream, which is aimed in part squarely at libertarian beliefs about the liberating effects of laissez-faire capitalism and individualism. Chris is also the editor of The Baffler, a magazine that in its early days claimed the mantle of H.L. Mencken in its crusade to inject a left-wing understanding of politics, culture, and ideas into public discourse. Chris, thanks for talking to us. Thanks for having me. Talk about Joel Osteen, the hugely popular ah, yes. televangelist <laughs> with whom you start your book. Uh -huh. How does he exemplify what you see as a perversion or at least a misguided vision of Protestant Christianity and the pursuit of mammon? Joel Osteen, for people who may not be familiar, is a pastor of the uh, 40,000 plus uh, Lakewood congregation in Houston, Texas. He is probably the most successful, best known pastor um, and pulpit orator in America today, and certainly the leading um, light um, extolling the prosperity gospel. And, and the prosperity <clears throat> gospel is basically if you are right with God, money will come God to you. God will reward you, and yeah. there are um, lots of um, ways in which they extol and instantiate this belief. Um, it, Osteen comes out of what's called the word of faith tradition in Pentecostalism, uh, that if you sort of um, ritually intone mantras of success and victory and triumph over adversity, God, you know, then heeds, you know, as Osteen preaches, there is a miracle in your mouth. Right. Um, and you and will... You, you know, up until about <laughs> 1985, you could get arrested for that. So, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, we have the libertarians to think. Yes. Uh, but um, word of faith comes out of Pentecostalism, which in the early 20th century was a millennialist religious movement among overwhelmingly poor, dispossessed uh, Southern whites and African Americans in Southern California. Um, and this is so, Amy Semple McPherson, yeah, she comes Billy director. Sunday types, yeah. etc. Um, yeah, and um, so you have the, and Amy Semple McPherson is a good sort of transitional figure because she practiced in, within, you know, the limits of Southern California at the time, a, a kind of progressive mm -hmm. social gospel. She uh, preached to integrated congregations, which was a very big deal. In, and in she Southern, was a woman herself, she was leading, a woman herself leading the show. Who was not, yeah, married, which sort of became a uh, trouble spot later um, because she evidently took up with a, a married radio producer in her empire. I, I mean, and, and you know, one of the, I think the great things of the book is that it is both an incredible tour of uh, 19th century America as well as mm -hmm. 20th and particularly in the 70s when uh, kind of Pentecostalism or evangel yeah. ev evangelical Christianity went mainstream with Jimmy Carter, with Hal Lindsey, with yeah. all sorts of cultural phenomenon. But uh, talk about how it blends with capitalism then. That, well, that's, in, that's the interesting story. So you do have what's originally this movement of, you know, that if you look at the broader history of millennialist, which is, you know, end times type right. belief, it has been throughout Western culture a movement of the dispossessed. So. It becomes, you know, in the hands of figures like Amy Simple McPherson, this sort of faith of the consumer marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, McPherson was famous for doing these uh, radio plays about her own misadventures, uh, you know, being stopped by a cop in Southern California. And um, she made herself, you know, this is where you get the same idea of word of faith. Like, you. You know, the believing self occupies center stage in the drama of salvation, and you get, um, you know, God smiles upon you for, um, you know, being his uh, chosen prophetess in this case. So you gradually shed a lot, and the 70s is a key mm -hmm. moment in my view because that is the moment of crisis for, um, you know, sort of uh, New Deal. Um, Liberalism, right. in, in and or you call it Keynesianism as well in the book, yeah, but it's, yeah, yeah, it's that the the, the post-war economic consensus was, right. was so, done. It right. wasn't working anymore, right. and so people you have didn't this, believe it. Right, and so you know the the you have stagflation, you have a massive explosion of interest rates. Um, you know the 
you know, the monetarist recession mm -hmm. that uh, uh, Volcker institutes under Carter, this, you know, creates this massive um, crisis mm -hmm. and people are thrown onto their own resources and particularly believing Protestants, you know, need, uh, you know, they both need a direct infusion of the Holy Ghost, which is what the Pentecostal mm -hmm. uh, tradition is all about. So they need this sort of experiential affirmation of their worth at a time when mm -hmm. the economy isn't giving it to them. Right. And they also, um, you know, turn to these prophets, you know, figures like Hal Lindsey, um, Maribel Morgan, the author mm -hmm. of The Total Woman in the Domestic Sphere. There is also this very, you know, overlooked, uh, scholars like Bethany Morton have done a very good work looking at how um, economic relations in the domestic sphere get reorganized. And then as the service economy, which becomes the principal source of economic growth in America, mobilizes all the, the kind of servant uh, ethos of Protestant womanhood becomes valuable. Mm -hmm. It becomes a model of worker discipline. And there's a separate movement in management theory called servant leadership that comes, that creates a whole sort of uh, cottage industry and management, spiritual management um, tracks that are all about how you have to, you know, simultaneously, um, you know, exemplify a spirit of humility in your working life, but also be intensely disciplined. And it's a very striking thing going back to Joel Osteen. Uh, he simultaneously, you know, preaches for workers a gospel of you know, joyful uh, acceptance of workplace hierarchies. You know, you, if, if you embrace the opportunities that God gives you, you will be rewarded, you know, in a, you know by a factor of 100. Right. <laughs> this, is a, this goes back to Oral Roberts, another right. key yeah. 70s figure. You know, one of, the, one of the strains in this that you pull through is the idea that this vision of Christianity, and it's, it's fundamentally a Protestant version mm -hmm. because it's kind of Gnostic, it's direct, right. unmediated contact right. with the, the Holy Spirit, yeah. but that it, it turns Christianity away uh, and from a communitarian faith to a very individualistic faith. Right. Um, and so that, and that's where, you know, capitalism and Christianity and the making of the American dream right. and your, your take comes in. Um, talk right. a little bit about how that then reveals itself in economic or, uh, or labor markets. Yeah, yeah. In point of fact, you know, um, religion is the first deregulated industry in America. Mm -hmm. um, when the uh, Congregational Church in Massachusetts, um, Massachusetts was the last state established church and it broke up in 1820, which was at the height both of the Second Great Awakening and what's called the Market Revolution, mm -hmm. uh, a time in American economic life where you have these massive um, infrastructure projects like the Erie Canal, like uh, toll roads connecting uh, border cities, um, and an explosion in um, government debt. Right. Uh, and debt, interestingly, at this moment, be goes from being a hated at any cumulative phase of capitalism, yeah. which you know Max Weber describes in the Protestant ethic in the spirit of capitalism, work becomes fetishized. Mm -hmm. It is a spiritual vocation. It's the way, you know, if you're an anxious Calvinist, the only thing you can know with certainty is that you have a divine calling and you had better do it. Right. <laughs> and then maybe God will reward you in the afterlife, but right. God is so opaque and angry, there's no way of knowing. And it. ultimately, Americans can't stand that because right. they know they want it in this They life. want certainty, yeah, yeah they yeah. want immediacy. Um, so, um, and that's the second great awakening overthrows Calvinism. Right. Uh, it's, it's all about sort of different competing visions of universal salvation and uh, free will is the huge kind of spiritual doctrine that, that overtakes American Protestantism then, which I would argue coincides perfectly right. with the market revolution. You have new opportunities, particularly in urban centers, um, port cities. Um, and so, I mean, in that way, this vision of Christianity where you're responsible for your own salvation, it's also, in American society, you're responsible for your station in life. You yeah. either make it or don't on your own merit. Right, right. Yeah. You're literally so, thrown back on your own resources. You yeah. know, that clearly seems true, uh, or, or it's a tight reading of kind of a long sweep of mm -hmm. uh, Protestant in theology and the way it affects American cultural identity, certainly through the 70s and into the 80s, maybe mm -hmm. even the 90s. 
At this point in time, though, is this a dead faith in, you know, certainly mm -hmm. the religious right and somebody like Joel Osteen, in, in a sense that you have to introduce him, mm -hmm. it makes him different than maybe Oral Roberts, but certainly, say, Norman Vincent Peale right. or earlier, um, you know, Televan or Billy Graham. Everybody right. would know who they are. So is is this actually a going concern? Or? No, I think I think you know, in, in an interesting way, it's it's succumbed to certain forces of market fragmentation, mm -hmm. right? Um, definitely, you know, Joel Osteen, you know, is worth his net worth is north of forty million dollars, so he's not yeah. <laughs> um, a marginal figure by right. any. I think he's theologically he's outside the mainstream. This whole yeah. um, word of faith tradition is regarded with you know great. Suspicion both from the right and the left mm -hmm. on the theological spectrum, but I would say that you know there, if anything, figures like we're going to see a lot more Joel Osteen. Mm -hmm. um, Joel Osteen and Donald Trump are great friends. Mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump was allegedly um, you know brought into a born again experience right. by a prosperity preacher, Paula right. White, in Florida, and this I and guess he grew up imbibing Nor Norman Vincent Peale. Right. So there's a very yeah. direct through line. Either. And it's and it's more in a way. It's I mean, while it's still pursuing a religious track, it's been highly secularized because this is the think and grow rich. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, it's a secular it, it, version. Yeah, you of can it. say it's secularized, but I sort of argue that what's happening isn't religion is becoming um, more uh, scientific or secular or mm -hmm. rational. The, the market is becoming an, uh, a mystical object of worship. Mm -hmm. The market is becoming sanctified. So that's Joel Osteen's God is delivering all of his bounty in the form of promotions, um, mm -hmm. wealth, new cars. It's, this is all very <laughs> front yeah. and center in, in, this, in the sermons and books that uh, Osteen. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's talk about the unmaking of the American dream. And I, I think in the book, you t you, one, one way it's, it's just implied or taken for granted, and yeah. that's that where, you know, uh, I, I don't know if you subscribe to the phrase late capitalism or advanced capitalism, but... I'd you know, sleepy there's, capitalism. Oh, <laughs> there's a you know there's a broad sense. Well, the middle class is finished. Economic growth is at two percent. If right. you're lucky, et cetera. That you kind of assume that. But then there's also uh, the other way, which is that this is kind of a war of all against all. That the mm -hmm. solidarity of the worker is gone, right. et cetera. So talk a little bit about how you define the unmaking of the American dream, and then how this line of thought is well, implicated in the, it. The first thing I always say about that phrase is that my agent wrote the subtitle mm -hmm. and presented it to me as a fait accompli, and I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I don't really have a coherent yeah. theory worked out of the, mm -hmm. uh, you can ask my agent, but, okay. uh, <laughs> um, but I do think it's apt in yeah. certain ways. Um, and I think what's striking is the fact, you know, we did endure, you know, a crippling recession in 2008 Mm -hmm. And from Ameri you know the leading pulpits in American um, Protestantism, there was almost no acknowledgement of this you know massive change. And you know even when you apply it to things, you know this this is not going to be popular with reason readers. Mm -hmm. But the debate over the ACA, whatever mm -hmm. you think about um, universal health care, it should be. Um, a lively subject of debate in the Christian community. One would think. Yes. Yeah, and know, maybe the, not you're government you're provided. Supposed, right, and but you're not, supposed to care yes. for the sick. Right. Um, and it's but, striking, nothing. But isn't it you know, also from, true that Protestants, including you know ministries like Austin's and others, and I know some mega churches in mm -hmm. the in the Northern Virginia area, actually do a huge amount of they do, charity work. Yep, they, they do uh, a lot of uh, missionizing, especially overseas. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now there is always that tradition. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sell it short, right. uh, but uh, you know what I'm writing about is, and even you know Oost, what's interesting in in the case of people like Osteen is um, charity too is ultimately a way that you are you know yes you're doing good works but right. you're also going to get a, a return on investment. Yes. Um, so um, and you also see like you know. Again, to, you know, it's it's cheap and easy here in D.C. in 2016 to always talk about Donald Trump, but I am in D.C. in 2016, and I will talk about Donald Trump. Um, he, you know, the week after he made his big pitch to a thousand evangelical leaders and and really galvanized them, convinced them he was an ardent culture warrior, called himself a tremendous believer because right. huge isn't big enough. Yes, <laughs> and uh, you'll notice the the Monday after that, the Washington Post had a report that uh, Trump was 
exaggerating the volume of his charitable giving by a factor of a couple hundred. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that it was, he was claiming it was in the millions, it was in fact less than $10,000 over, or less, yeah, less than $10,000 over seven years. So, you know, you pan back and you ask, yeah. you know, whatever else it is, the idea that you're, you're kind of stiffing um, charitable causes mm -hmm. and then lying about it, yeah, but it's no, not very all, Christian. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no it's, it's not even very <laughs> so, human or very American. Right, uh, right. Like, and so, you know, I, that is, in a sense, the problem I'm trying to and, explain in the book. How right. do you have this, you know, guy who's now, you know, getting real traction in the evangelical community, and, you know, he does not embody the spirit of charity, honesty, or anything else. Right. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the baffler for a moment, sure. uh, and the, you know, in whose pages I know I and other reason <laughs> authors and reason readers have been slain at various points. But no, which is fine. But it's it's a classic sort of what uh, what used to be called the little magazine, mm -hmm. not unlike reason that punches far above its weight. Uh, the question I wanted to ask, as you've taken over the editorship of it over the past couple of years, as it came back from a kind of hiatus, what do you hope to uh, yeah, what do you hope to do with the the baffler? You know, I I I think you know it's. We, we we're out to destroy reason. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, well, you know, we'll get in line. <laughs> no, no, no. You know, I want to make long form magazine journalism. You know, connect with a new audience mm -hmm. that occupies this you know somewhat fragmented mm -hmm. digital media sphere. You know, I want the the Baffler to be the best journal of culture criticism in America. I think, you know, there's no reason you do something like this unless you right. have a, you know, sort of messianic, as it were, right. <laughs> sense of mission. Um, and I think, you know, I think we want to shake up, you know, uh, bland orthodoxies across the spectrum. Do you feel that the left is kind of on its heels these days? Uh, it depends, you know, like everything else, you have to define your terms. You could say like the Bernie Sanders movement, whatever else. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it it galvanized a big following of you know impassioned younger activists and voters. What's interesting to me is you had the same structurally you had the same thing happen within the Democratic Party in two thousand eight, and you know they found a way to embrace that. And this time they have. Uh, but is that because uh, Barack Obama so was not really as radical, or he didn't talk the same? Yeah, language. I mean he he yeah, talked. I mean, he's very centrist. Ultimately. Yeah, no, he talked a, a, a sort of rhetoric of um, uh, radical um, procedural, right. um, you know, we are the change we've been waiting for. It, it you know, it was all about it's process. Like, well, I talk about yeah. you know, underselling it. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. So, well, I, so, and I guess. Uh, but yeah, I go. do think, you know, there, there is, you know, we discuss this a lot within the Baffler world that, uh, you know, there, um, for a, an intellectual community that sort of prides itself on um, iconoclasm and, mm -hmm. and smashing, um, you know, traditions or whatever. There's there is a lot of hidebound orthodoxy on mm -hmm. the left. There are things you're not supposed to say and think. And you know, anytime I'm, you know, this is just my temperament. Anytime I'm told you can't think something, I. I'm determined to th think it that that much well, more. Uh, okay, so let me make a final pitch because <laughs> sure. you know, and, and this is something. I mean, I think the book is fantastic, and okay. it's just like even in the parts that I don't agree with, I learned so much and and remembered so much from history. Right. So you know, just phenomenal that way. And the Baffler, which I read but I disagree with, um, almost every comma, every you know, every <laughs> don of ink. We copy um, at a very close. Yeah, but <laughs> it's uh, which well that you've got that over us. So. But for all of the differences in worldview and temperament between, say, like a Baffler left and a reason, a libertarian reason, because mm -hmm. you know there are all different types of people. There's a lot of issues in which the you know kind of broadly defined libertarian. Uh, a libertarian right and maybe a libertarian left or, or left mm -hmm. are in agreement. Uh, you know, that, the, that centrist groups in the Republican and Democratic parties are useless, right. they're contemptible, uh, they need to be removed from power, that cronyism, right. whether it's government contracts or, or corporate cronyism is a real problem. Yeah. Foreign policy is almost always yeah, stupidly right. taken, uh, you know, it's conceived poorly and then ineffective in application. And that things like cultural expression are more important. Mm -hmm. or proceed political action or inform it, you know. Right. Um, what are the areas in which these kinds of overlaps can, you know, is there a coalition to be had between a kind of libertarian right and a progressive left or a, you know, uh, and yeah, where does yeah. that happen? I, I, 
I may represent that coalition because I think I'm the only person to have contributed both to the Baffler and Reason. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you're looking at it. Okay. So <laughs> but no, right. I mean, so I we've, think we've got to go out and get new allies. <laughs> though, right? We need more bodies. But um, I think things like foreign policy are definitely um, a, a area of. I think most of the things you've listed. I think you know there is a shared contempt for. Um, difference trimming of mm -hmm. like neoliberal centrism on, on the democratic side and you know i don't even know what to say about the republicans they yeah. are a party that is in the process of um i i suspect you know dramatic uh reinvention oh yeah they're they're, they're uh, molting right it's, i mean <laughs> no, we don't no, know what's really, going right. to happen no, but yeah is, they're, they're going to look a, very different in a few years um but yeah i think um you know there is um and there are some respects in which, you know, I'm, you know, I think leftists should have a suspicion of the state. You know, all institutions are, you know, reflections of human nature, which is a flawed um, material to work so, with. Uh, well, we'll end it with that in invocation of a basic Christian doctrine. There you go. Right? That we uh, yes, are, I, don't, I, I often say, you know, I'm, I'm not a believer in, uh, you know, the, the well, you're not a believer in salvation, but you are in original sin. sin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, we will leave it there. We've been talking with Chris Lehman. He's the author most recently of the excellent book, The Money Cult, Capitalism, Christianity, and the Unmaking of the American Dream. Chris, thanks for talking to us. Thanks for having me. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.